Okay, so let's begin. Uh, this course is called uh, CS 772 Deep Learning for Natural Language Processing. This is a sequel to the course uh, CS 6 to 6, okay, last semester. But I understand many of you could not do that course because of slot, slot clash. So I would suggest that you should look at those uh, recordings. <laughs> and uh, uh, Shravanti, who is uh, the uh, head of the TA team, okay, uh, Shravanti, if you can get up and show yourself. Yeah. So she will be able to help you access those lectures. And uh, it will be useful to do that because that course was for uh, concept building. This course is very uh, technique oriented. Okay, and the technique is uh, mainly neural network based uh, deep learning system. But before that, uh, we have to uh, understand how natural language processing is uh, very uh, dependent on probability, the probability values coming from the data, and how to model probability on a neural network. Okay, so this is a very important question how probability is uh, represented in a neural network. So those uh, basic points are important. So uh, in this course, we'll be concentrating on a deep learning system for natural language processing. And there is a reason why a deep learning became uh, bread and butter for natural language processing for, for today. Uh, I would say that uh, the time was uh, not ripe for neural networks being applied to natural language processing. Neural networks are quite old. Okay, deep learning systems are old. Since 1960s, we have had uh, perceptrons and multilayer perceptrons and so on, but they were waiting for the data to be available. Okay, and these systems require huge amount of data. We'll see why so, so such large amount of data is required. Anyway, uh, so today is the introductory lecture. Now, uh, let's make a few uh, perspective based remarks. So first and foremost, what is this entity called language? Okay. Now human languages have uh, certain very interesting properties which are not shared by other uh, examples of communication. Okay. For example, communication between two birds, communication between let's say two dogs or two cats and so on. It is now proven that human language has some properties which do not uh, appear to be the case for other animal communications. So first uh, important property and which is also extremely intriguing is the property of displacement. And we do take these things for granted, but the property of displacement is very intriguing and very deep. Okay. So human communication based on language allows me to displace my myself, okay, allows me to have multiple avatars of myself at multiple places, at least conceptually. So uh, I can uh, say things like, uh, I saw him yesterday at the market, okay, and uh, the time is yesterday and the place is market, and I am saying this from a location which is not the market, and the time is also not yesterday. Okay, but I'm, I can uh, talk about something uh, without being present at that time and at that place. This is the property of displacement. Okay, and an extremely fundamental property of language, and it has been very difficult to model this property in uh, computational systems. Okay, so the first is displacement, and then arbitrariness. Arbitrariness is the property of the name and the entity mapping. Why is water call, called water? Because water is not called water in Hindi. It's called Pani. In Bengal, it is called Jal. So this name to concept mapping is arbitrary. Okay, so this is another property. Most probably animals use uh, what is called onometopia. Okay, some, uh, some sound pattern, which is close to the actual sound of the uh, event. Or the phenomenon. For example, the word hissing has the property of onomatopoeia. Okay, the, the word sounds like hiss. Okay, so this is arbitrariness. Then productivity. Potentially infinite number of sentences can be created. Okay, so given the words and the grammar of the language, you can 
potentially create infinite number of languages, the infinite number of strings. <laughs> then uh, this actually happens because of the uh, recursivity property of language. Hmm? Recursivity property of the language, that means you can embed sentences within sentences. Okay, so the, uh, I can say the cat spilled the milk. The cat which was running away from me spilled the milk. The cat which was running from me who was watching it spilled the milk. So I can embed you know, arbitrary, arbitrary amount of sentential strings within a sentence. So this is a recursive property of the language. Then uh, cultural transmission, the child acquires the parent's language and not other languages. So there is uh, this property of human language. Then discreteness, sound and meaning units are separated. When I'm speaking, there is continuous signals, but uh, in the communication, we create these boundaries for words, then sentences, phrases, and so on. Okay, you can hear me speak distinct words. You can hear me, distinct words, okay? Some six, seven entities. So this is the discreteness and duality, surface structure and deep structure. What you see on the surface of the text need not be uh, same as the deeper meaning. So a good, very good example of that is sarcasm, okay? I love being ignored. So the, in this sentence, which is my favorite sentence for sarcasm, I love being ignored. This is a sarcastic sentence. Actually, I'm expressing my sadness at, at being ignored, okay? But I'm saying I love being ignored. So these properties of language uh, define human communication, displacement, arbitrariness, productivity, cultural transmission, discreteness, and duality. What, what has this got to do with uh, deep learning for NLP? The reason is that uh, deep, uh, in deep learning for NLP requires annotated data, okay? And the data that is created for training a machine learning model needs to have its uh, uh, own annotation many times, okay? So those annotations are uh, labels and richness imparted to raw text. Okay, so that requires understanding the property of the language as well as the task. And the other uh, 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 point is that when a machine learning module has produced the results, we have to understand why we are getting the output that we are seeing in front of us. Okay, it needs an explanation. So there again, we need to understand the properties of the language. So it's a good idea to keep these six, seven properties in mind and see how it uh, plays its role, okay, in very interesting ways in different language tasks and in the NLP systems. Okay, so this is one foundation we have to keep in mind. Uh, the next, uh, uh, the next point is the uh, the very marvelous device, human brain, which processes language. Okay, so when we are engineering a deep learning based system, we have in front of us a bench benchmark. The benchmark is the human brain itself, which is a collection of neurons, okay? And many times it is the human performance that we hope to reach when we create natural language processing systems. Now, it is then useful to know uh, how human brain processes language and which part of the brain is involved in processing language. So, uh, the, uh, there are two areas in the brain the first is called Broca's area, and the second is called Wernicke's area. So Broca's area and Wernicke's area. And uh, this, this particular uh, device, the human brain, is of course a collection of very large number of neurons and their connections, okay? But there are designated areas in the brain which is uh, responsible for language processing, Broca's area and Wernicke's area. By the way, Designating areas of the brain for specific abilities is called probing. And the word probing has become again important in deep learning based systems. We would like to probe hidden layers in the neural network. Okay, what is each hidden layer doing is called probing. And that's a very, very important and interesting task, but also is uh, very complex when the network is very deep and complex. Okay, so let's go back to this point about uh, Broca's area. Broca's area deals with syntax or the grammar. So 
through accident or some kind of disease, if the broadcast area gets uh, damaged, then um, ungrammatical speech is produced. Okay, so I eat rice with spoon, and uh, uh, I eat. Huh? So the sentence is I eat rice spoon. So the word order is disturbed, and this is violating the grammar. Okay, so broadcast area is responsible for syntax. And uh, uh, broadcast area damaged patients cannot differentiate between visit to the president versus visit by the president. Because function words like preposition, conjunction, they are not processed accurately huh, in the brain. And uh, uh, Wernicke's area has the complementary function. The damage messes up semantics and pragmatics. Okay, so uh, uh, fluent meaningless uh, phrases can be produced. The pink elephant uh, sang and the blue stone danced. The grammar is perfect, but the sentence doesn't mean anything. So semantics gets impaired when there is damage in the Wernicke's area. Okay, so Broca's area and Wernicke's area have been probed and have been uh, designated as the areas dealing with syntax and semantics of language. So when Wernicke's area is da damaged, it also interferes with pragmatics. Okay, so pragmatics means what is the intent? of the sentence, okay? What is the intent of the sentence? What is the situation in which the sentence is said? What is the context? Uh, context? So those fine uh, things about the sentence are lost in pragmatic. Uh, these are called pragmatic cues. They are lost, okay? Uh, so that was the nature of language and uh, the, the, the actual neural network which processes language. Now, what is the nature of natural language processing? It is the art, science, and technique of making computers understand and generate language. Now, we would like to replicate uh, human's ability on uh, a device called the computer. Now, this is a classic diagram which has uh, stayed over the years. Natural language processing is known to take place in layers. Okay, even language processing is believed to take place in layers, but of course there is a lot of back and forth flow of information. So first layer is morphology. We break the word into its parts and try to identify uh, the morphemes, okay, and their functions, okay. Jaunga, for example, has two parts, ja and unga. So the root ja indicates the action of going and unga indicates first person, singular number, future tense, right. Uh, this is morphology. Pause tagging, we identify the part of speech of words, okay, verb, noun, adjective, adverb, etc. Uh, we, we just now saw why part of speech tagging is important. We saw that when uh, Broca's area gets damaged, okay, uh, the patient loses the ability of dealing with function words. So prepositions are function words. So we need to know what, which words are prepositions? And those words will get recognition and pro production of those words will get affected. By the way, am I still audible at the back? Clearly audible? Okay. Then uh, ch chunking. We tend to form small groups of words, okay, with uh, coherent meaning. The blue sky, for example, the little boy, okay, the green grass and so on. So chunking is uh, forming of small phrases. Parsing is the complete deep tree of the sentence, okay? The sentence is a linear structure, but the parse tree is a two-dimensional structure and it indicates a deeper structure which is based on the grammar for the sentence. Then uh, we come to semantics which deals with the meanings of words and the meaning that emerges from the sentence because of the interplay of meanings of words. Finally, we have discourse and uh, co uh, discourse and co-reference, where large pieces of text are processed by uh, the processing entity. Could be a human, could be a machine, but large pieces of text processing is uh, the is the concern here. Also, uh, natural language processing has uh, these three axes. The most important part is the problem, the problem that we are trying to solve. For example, we would like to detect the sentiment 
in a uh, in a sentence we would like to summarize a document so that is the problem now we are trying to do it for some language so maybe summarization for french question answering for bengali and so on and then the algorithm axis that is the technique axis which solves the problem for this particular language now uh, this both these diagrams are important because we need to uh, have a systematic approach to creating natural language processing systems and what works for uh, language l1 need not work as well for language l2 okay so lots of nlp tools and systems have been created for english but when we try to adapt them to let's say tamil or hindi or gujarati we do find that the uh, the system doesn't work as well but now we know that here again machine learning tries to step in and give us solutions through transfer learning okay transfer learning zero shot learning few shot learning they are extremely relevant for natural language processing okay then uh, then this this diagram is also important where we have different natural language processing tasks and problems this is these are on the rows and on the columns we have uh, techniques for solving these tasks so uh, from the very early days of natural language processing we have rule based systems when we we do not have uh, sufficient amount of data we have to work with what is called model based uh, system building we create a theory of how language works or how a particular problem needs to be solved okay then we sit down and give rules which is not a very scalable activity then came uh, some amount of data and classical machine learning started getting applied to natural language processing tasks for example hidden markov model was used for solving the part of speech tagging problem you identify which words are nouns verbs etc and uh, hidden markov model was very successful since 19 uh, about 80s 90s okay this came from the speech community so uh, so, so so those of you who have not done CS 626, do please look at my lectures on part of speech tagging and so solving of part of speech tagging by hidden Markov model. Okay, definitely do that. Otherwise, you do not have a feel for why machine learning is useful for natural language processing. A very good example of uh, machine learning applied to NLP is part of speech tagging using hidden Markov model. Okay, and in this course, we will be concerned with deep learning, this particular column and uh, all these uh, tasks which are on the rows okay so you can see that we have uh, fit for our network uh, recurrent neural network convolutional neural network and now of course a lot of large language model are being used for uh, nlp so this uh, task versus technique matrix is like a uh, guiding framework for us okay we will operate in this uh, column but we'll have to understand uh, these rows also. Okay. Now, natural language processing, of course, is language and computation. But because of the advent of machine learning and because of the interaction between machine learning and NLP, we uh, can specialize this and say that natural language processing is linguistics and probability, combination of linguistics and probability. Okay. Language science and data science. So it's a combination of language science and data science. Now, uh, there are three generations of NLP, the rule-based natural language processing. This is also called model-driven NLP. We create a model or we think of a model for language and task, and we uh, give rules for solving a task. Then statistical machine learning-based NLP, examples are hidden Markov models, support vector machine, etc. Support vector machines were very successful for text classification. And then neural, which is the uh, paradigm for today, uh, this, this modern times, this is deep learning based NLP. And the course is concerned with understanding deep learning for NLP. But uh, to appreciate deep learning for NLP, we have to uh, often refer to statistical NLP and rule based NLP. Okay. One important contribution of rule-based NLP is that it forces you to understand the task extremely well. 
okay if you talk to a deep learning based nlp researchers many of them don't care for what the task and the language properties are what do you mean by question answering what do you mean by summarization what is sentiment what is emotion maybe uh, we do, do not care for those things because you just take the annotated data feed it into a large deep learning system and uh, we get the output so this doesn't give us any insight into problem now it is debatable whether we need that insight or not we definitely need that insight for understanding the results and doing error analysis and these days if you look at top conferences and journals we quite happily see that uh, they demand insightful analysis from the for the results okay it is not just take data and feed into a model so this is uh, the this is the merit of looking at rule based natural language processing why should we look at statistical natural language processing statistical natural language processing because this is the first time which uh, showed why data training data could be used for natural language solving natural language processing tasks and the other contribution of these statistical ml based nlp is to understand and uncover the role of probability in natural language processing okay the critical importance of probability in natural language processing so that is the merit of understanding statistical ml based nlp and the merit of deep learning based nlp is the spectacular performance and the scalability and the robustness okay so the 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 scalability is absolutely mind boggling all of you have used chat gpt and the way it interacts okay in the conversational setting is absolutely mind boggling so the robustness is great the scalability is great and that is the contribution of deep learning for nlp so let me uh, let me summarize the points that i said for this particular slide they're all very important you should hear them carefully first rule based nlp forces you to have understanding of language and the task no other approach gives you that uh, for uh, gives you that facility statistical nlp forces you to understand the role of probability for language processing second point third point neural nlp gives you the facility for robust and scalable natural language processing systems okay so do please remember this uh, and if there is any question do ask me as we uh, go along and any time you can raise your hand and ask any question now main challenge of natural language processing is ambiguity what is difficult about language processing it is ambiguity there is no doubt that this is the one and only challenge for language processing so ambiguity means multiple meanings of words phrases sentences and so on so let me take this example this example is from a lecture by professor mirella lapata the name of the lady is lapata now of course hindi speakers will you know find it uh, a bit of a bit amusing i suppose okay for this for this particular surname but again here ambiguity is playing a role the, this is a proper name professor mirella lapata okay and this is a named entity proper name but if you use code mixing if you mix two languages then this can be ambiguous so for example lapata lapata ho gaya okay <laughs> okay if you mix uh, english and hindi now uh, she, this is from a lecture by professor lapata uh, not past part past huh? maybe all of you have seen this small poem already past is history future is mystery present is a gift so it is called present now it is a play on the words and uh, it is exploiting ambiguity Pres the word present has multiple meanings it can be a gift and that's why the present time is called present right so you are exploiting ambiguity now you can e easily see that uh, ambiguity is ambiguity is not always undesirable okay if ambiguity is weeded out lot of color from language and life also is lost okay this beautiful poem would not be possible without the ambiguity of the word present okay another example 
this is code mixing. Okay, if you look at the English string, you probably see that there are four possibilities. Does everybody understand Hindi here? Maybe not. Hmm? Okay, so let me read this. This MAT, MAT, and then Bichau can be read as Mat Mat Bichau. Don't don't spread. So this is emphasizing uh, the negation. Chatai Mat Bichau. This mat is Chatai. Chatai Mat Bichau. Don't spread the mat. Chatai Chatai Bichau. Emphasizing Chatai two times. Okay. Chatai Chatai Bichau. Chatai, chatai vichau. So there is the emphasis. Mat chatai vichau. Okay. So there are these four possibilities. And the ambiguity is arising because of the mixing of two languages. This is also called code mixing. So one language itself has ambiguity. And if you allow two languages to be mixed, you can see that the ambiguity can increase. Now we come to another example. This is a very famous example from natural language processing. Read this sentence for, for, for a while. Does anybody understand this, this sentence? Anybody? What is the meaning of this sentence? Buff buffalo, buffaloes, buffalo, buffaloes, buffalo, 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 buffaloes. Looks like a gibberish, no? Yeah, buffalo has many meanings. Yes, what are these meanings? Buffalo is animal, yes. Buffalo is the name of a city, proper noun, yes. Buffalo also means bullying. Bullying, baffling, confusing. Now, if you know that buff the word buffalo has these three meanings, can you parse this sentence and tell me the meaning? Can you? Can anybody? Before that, let's do some pause tagging. Which which is the main verb in this sentence? Which one? There are there are how many? One, two, three buffaloes. Which one? This is the main verb. <laughs> First, second, third, anyway. Second one. This is part of speech tagging. Main verb. Okay, so very difficult for human beings to parse this. So I gave this prompt to Chat GPT. What do you understand by the above sentence? And what did Chat GPT say? It began this way Buffalo noun, part of speech tagging done, refers to the city of Buffalo, which is the, in the state of New York in United States. Great. Buffalo as a verb means to bully, confuse, or baffle. Buffalo as a noun refers to the animal, spe specifically the American bison. Why American bison? I think it also means bass, right, in Hindi? Hmm? That is also same. So, Chad GPT does not mention bass, okay, Indian buffalo. So, it describes a scenario where bison from buffalo are being intimidated, intimidated or confused by other bison from the same place who in turn are intimidating or confusing other bison. It is a playful <coughs> sentence that plays on the multiple meanings of the word buffalo as a place, as a verb and as uh, an animal. Okay, so, so do you still understand what the sentence means? Okay, if you read it, read it with proper parsing. So you should hear me take the correct pauses. Buffalo, buffaloes. A type of buffalo which are from Buffalo in USA. Buffalo, buffaloes. Buffalo, buffaloes, buffalo. First set of buffaloes is this. Buffalo, buffaloes. 
Second set of buffaloes are these. Buffalo buffaloes, which, which uh, are bullied by the second set of buffaloes from buffalo, in their turn, buffalo, that is bully, a third set of buffalo buffaloes. Okay. So buffalo buffaloes, which buffalo buffaloes buffalo, second set, buffalo, they in turn bully third set of buffalo buffaloes. That is the structure. Okay. So what is the chunking here? That is grouping. First two words get grouped, buffalo buffaloes. Second uh, set of uh, buffalo buffaloes also get grouped. This buffalo is not the main part. This buffalo is the action of the second set of buffaloes. The subject of the sentence is this first set of buffaloes, buffalo buffaloes. And they buffalo, this is the main verb, bully. The third set of buffalo buffaloes, this is the, this is another group, buffalo buffaloes. Clear? Okay. Now, uh, chat GPT, did it understand this? Yes. Uh, a scenario where bison from buffalo, first set, are being intimidated or confused by other bison from the same place, second set, who in turn are intimidating or confusing other bison, the third set. So it understands this. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. So does, does chat GPT, okay, now just continuing the story. Uh, I also asked this to the Bing, Bing search engine. Bing search, search engine has chat facility. Do you know? Okay, Bing, you can do chatting with Bing search engine. So Bing chat response was this. It first created the parse tree correctly. Parsing was done in the last semester. So the sentence has a noun phrase, a big noun phrase. This big noun phrase is this. Buffalo, buffaloes, buffalo, buffaloes, buffalo. The buffalo buffaloes, which are bullied by a second set of buffalo buffaloes. So this is the noun phrase. And the word phrase is this, bully other buffalo buffaloes. So this, in this word phrase, we have this verb, which is the main verb. And buffalo buffalo is the object of this one. Okay, so this parse tree is correct. So being, uh, being produced this parse tree. So does being chat have parsing ability? Most probably no, most probably it is just picking it up from the data, okay? And it is, so it, it, it's, its answer is also correct. In other words, the sentence claims that bison from Buffalo, New York, who are intimidated by other bison in their community, in turn intimidate other bison in their community. First set, second set, third set, all these fine. Now comes the deep question of AI, a question which has been asked for 2000 years. What is intelligence? Okay, what is intelligence? And uh, are we really displaying intelligence? Or are we just uh, going through the emotion which looks intelligent? Now, in this particular, yeah. Just before that, uh, so it might also be possible that it's uh, doing the uh, this tagging part of speech tagging and taking the most realistic of the all possibilities of tagging. So it might not have seen this particular data, but mm -hmm. use of buffalo at different places and different locations on the sentence and taking the most probabilistic version of this. Mm. So, uh, yeah, so Himanshu's point is that uh, most probably the system is doing actual part of speech tagging, doing chunking, parsing, taking the most probable reading of this. If it does that, it will be great, but, but I'm almost 99% sure it is not doing that because because uh, the data on which ChatGPT is trained surely contains one lecture of mine where this has been done. Okay, and many times before me, this sentence has been uh, shown in the class by various NLP professors. Okay, and it must have ingested this and it is just doing uh, what is called RAG. Okay, retrieval augmented generation. Just retrieving. 
but it, it, it gives you a impression of being intelligent no it gives you a very good impression of uh, being intelligent yeah <clears throat> Hmm. Okay, okay. So, good point, good point. So, I, I did not finish my story. So, now you can carry out a conversation with Chat GPT. Okay. Now you can say, why are you saying this? Why is this your explanation? Okay. Then it comes back and says that, uh, you know, Buffalo actually has three meanings, which I have told you already before. Okay. And when you go through the sequence, your first uh, important task is to identify the main verb of the sentence that all of you should remember. Okay. In any sentence, the first thing to hit is the main verb. And it gives you this explanation. Now, would you say it is intelligent? Or would you say that this explanation also has been given by somebody and it has picked up that explanation as, and showing it to you? So this becomes a very uh, challenging problem. So it's a question of processing versus retrieval. When do we know that system is processing? And when can we be sure that no, it is ab initio computing, processing and producing the result? Valid question? Retrieval versus processing. And, and if you say that if it is processing, then it is intelligent. Will you agree? So, yeah. Ah. 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 <laughs> Very good point. Very good point. So, so yeah, so yeah, there is a very related statement by Professor Noam Chomsky, the celebrated linguist. So now uh, you have a temperature controller, okay? And if the temperature uh, falls below a threshold, the room feels very cold, the temperature controller automatically increases the temperature and vice versa. Can we say that this temperature controller is sensitive to heat? It feels warm or feels cold. Can we say that? No? So the boundaries begin to get blurred, right? Boundaries begin to get blurred. So what happened? So Chomsky similarly said that does Chat GPT have intelligence is as foolish or as meaning meaningless to us? Does submarine know swimming? <laughs> the status of this question is same as this question. Okay, so very, very gray areas if you begin to probe. And so, you know, engineers decided that we will not probe. There is no end to this. We will instead create a lot of data, feed into an ML model, and do useful things. Let other people do this thinking, but you cannot go, get away from that. Okay, so yeah. What is the form of benzene? What is the form of benzene? Benzene. Acha, okay. If I send it to data, it's very much something. I can't get it at all. But if I try to retrieve it from Google or something, if I can't get it, most of the time, I can't get anything from that sentence. Oh. So they're retrieving it. And if I create some new question, then post it, it's very small. Then plot in that. Yeah, yeah. So, so we work a, a lot on uh, medical NLP, and we have seen that ChatGPT fails quite miserably in uh, answering very specialized uh, questions, medical questions. Okay. So, uh, yeah. So, what is the uh, technique? What is the precise technical description of a fatty liver? Okay, so there is a particular medical name, and if you give the dimensions of the liver and uh, its condition, etc., etc., to Chat GPT, which is medical knowledge, a doctor can answer this, and the doctor will come back and say that the 
the viewer has some parenchyma or whatever, some technical term. But ChatGPT doesn't answer this uh, satisfactorily. In very do specialized domains, it, it uh, does not answer correctly. Okay, most probably because it has not been uh, ingested, it has not been trained, found as a training data. It's probably. Yeah. In the debate of retrieval versus processing, consider, considering to be intelligent, mm. can we argue that uh, retrieval along with the reasoning capabilities by that particular retriever could be also considered equivalent ah. to process? Mm -hmm. so, so that's a good point. That's a good point. So if you have retrieval and uh, then also Ah, okay. Yeah. So, uh, so this can be an infinite regress actually. So uh, if you uh, have the retrieval and then also ask the system to explain and it produces an explanation. And if the explanation itself is also retrieved, okay, explanation is also retrieved because of the huge amount of data. Now it is retrieved and you again ask, explain your explanation. That also is retrieved. So it can be in a, a very long you know, regress. But most probably not because if you keep on probing and pushing, ultimately uh, this becomes a, uh, ultimately I think there comes a point where the, where that uh, challenge is finally met, I suppose, I suppose so, yeah, okay. So, so this is the, this is an interesting example of how huge amount of data and huge amount of resource can give an impression of intelligence, okay. Now we uh, go back to this uh, Matt, Math Bichau. So there are these four possibilities and we ask which is the correct meaning? This cannot be answered without more information. The linguistic approach to answering this question is uh, model based. It depends on A, the context, B, the meaning of the words and C, composition. Okay, composition means how the meanings of the words interact with each other. The other approach is the data approach. It depends on the frequency, that is maximum likelihood and that is what the language model does. So out of these four meanings, which one is most likely you think? Second one, chatai mat bichao, hmm? mat mat bichao. Why would you say that? Why, why is it uh, mat mat bichao? Because uh, the structure of the subject In Hindi normally, the negation particle math comes after the noun. Okay, it is a frequentist observation. Why is it not math math bichao? That is emphasis actually, math math bichao. So that is emphasis, why is it not, uh, why is it not the first choice? Because less likely, less frequency, okay. And then uh, chatai chatai bichao also is because of emphasis again and such sentences are not very frequent. Okay. Hmm. So, uh, while we are doing uh, pre-processing of data, we mostly tend to remove all the perfection. Then, how how would we uh, how would we capture emphasis or uh, sentences like mat uh, sorry mat mat bicha hmm. or mat mat bicha? So, how do we uh, end up uh, capturing the emphasis of the data? Yeah, we means who? We means. Uh, just uh, us in general, like how human beings. Yeah, yeah. So, so, uh, so the signal comes from many different channels. So one is tone. Okay, emphasis. We often capture emphasis by higher frequency, that is higher pitch, or higher volume, amplitude. Okay, mat mat bichao. That is the emphasis, and the tone also changed. So these signals come. Especially in speech, in speech there is no punctuation, but pause can happen, of course. But punctuations are not always removed. You will see, you know, our uh, papers on sarcasm, where we make use of these explanation symbols, semicolons. They also come as tokens, and they are very important signals for disambiguation. So it is not true that punctuations are always removed. Yeah. Okay. So again, very important point. 
model based approach versus data approach okay this will be based on probability this will be based on linguistic theory as well as the theory of the task theory of summarization for example theory of emotions okay now of course this course will pay a lot of attention to large language models and uh, uh, we have to sort of you know in in the course we have to uh, take into account the most recent developments and link it with recent developments have to be linked with the foundations okay it is important to trace how language models have come how large language models have come so llms are surprisingly doing a very simple thing all they do is predict the next word or the sentence and or fill in the gaps these are called masked language models fill in the gaps and this uh, is an example of self supervised learning there is no annotated data if you are taking n words and predicting the n plus 1th word okay the data is already there for you the machine learning task is also specified predict the next word so this is called self supervised learning the data itself is telling you what the learning task is and uh, uh, self supervised learning set the parameters for prediction so while doing this prediction prediction you initialize the weights and through back propagation which is again another foundation for us you set the parameters for prediction so use the following in increasing order of resource demand for specific task after you have got the large language model you make use of uh, one of these four depending on how much resource you have the first is prompt engineering this is least resource hungry okay we'll do prompt engineering in the class but prompt engineering is not so technology or science driven it is more humanities and arts driven more language driven more task driven then the next uh, least resource hungry is adapter network so you have a small fit for our network after the large language model and train it through again through back propagation and the annotated data so that is also a very low resource uh, demand situation the next um, resource demanding situation is fine tuning okay take the sentiment analysis data or summarization data and uh, train the large retrain the large language model but making sure that you change the weights of only upper layer of the neural network upper few layers of the neural network do not go deep into the uh, network for changing the parameters this is called fine tuning and then the most resource intensive is pre training that means retrain the large language model ab initio this is not possible for lot of people only apples and googles and metas ibms can do this job microsoft can do this job uh, so other institutes or other organizations can hardly do this pre training okay if the number of parameters is trillion billion and the number of tokens is trillion it is impossible for everybody to do this kind of training okay so let's remember this also because it will be important for our assignments and projects prompt engineering adapter network fine tuning pre training the last option is pre training any questions any comments any remark from tejpal shravanti anything you want to say on this point this sequence of resource hungriness pavan anybody yeah adapter network is you uh, introduce a small fit forward network on top of the large language model okay connected to the large language and trade on train only that yeah the difference between adapter network and fine tuning is that in this uh, uh, procedure we introduce additional layers and they are only fit for our network okay now the three stages of llm based conversational ai for chat gpt are uh, generative pre training supervised fine tuning reinforcement learning based on human feedback and the spectacular performance of chat gpt is not only due to uh, the data and the resource and the training it is also due to what are called ai programmers okay 
very large number of uh, people, maybe 1,000, 2,000 people actually sit with the chat GPT system continuously. And whenever chat GPT's answer is not satisfactory, either feed the answer directly into the system so that it, next time it becomes a retrieval problem or, you know, does some fine tuning or changes if some parameters, uses reinforcement learning to tell the chat GPT that your answer should be better. So it gets continuously improved. There is continuous human intervention through this stage, reinforcement learning based on human feedback. So these are the things uh, we need to understand as uh, conceptual uh, framework and also their methodologies, okay, which, which we'll do in the course. Now evolution of LLMs, if we look at the history, perceptrons or just single neuron devices came in 1960s. We'll cover perceptron, okay, one or two classes will be devoted to understand the theory of perceptron. So let me tell you in this course, in this course, it is a course, okay, it's a four month course, for about 40 lectures course. We have to spend time on background foundation. Otherwise, you know, deep learning, there are umpteen number of courses on deep learning. There, are, there is enormous amount of inform information on the net on deep learning and deep learning and NLP. What is the need for doing this course? The need for doing this course is that you will see a lot of things are being stitched together. There are new interpretations of what you see on the web, okay? And also maybe my experience, my lab's experience, my students' experience, which are worth uh, noting, okay? That is the reason for doing the course. And this building a clear picture of the whole area, that is not possible without a course, okay? So do not, uh, do not be carried away by terminology and lots of hypes and so on. Understand the science and technology behind it. That is the purpose of the course. So we have to spend time on understanding the building block of the deep learning system, one single neuron. And it has such intriguing properties. Okay, we'll spend time on this. Then feed forward network and back propagation algorithm, the most important algorithm of the course. The one and only algorithm, back propagation for training networks. For training deep learning neural, any neural network based parameters, there is no approach other than back propagation. Only one. So back propagation, we have to understand carefully. Then recurrent neural networks are a fit for our net network which replicates itself on time over time. Okay, recurrent neural network is a fit for our network which is replicating itself in the, in steps. Then we come to this is in in eighties fit for our network back propagation nineteen eighty four. Attention came in 2015. See the time gap, 80s and then straight away 2015. In between, there were incremental additions to deep learning systems. But completely paradigm shift and revolutionary change, these, those, those have been enumerated here. Attention, okay, in 2015. Then transformers came in 2017. Attention and positional encoding combined together. Now it is LLMs, which is uh, uh, this, uh, the GPT series. We have seen them flourishing from 2020s. Okay, so this is the timeline. 60s, 80s, 2015, 2017, 2020 in rapid success, succession. Okay. But language models are very old, at least 2000 years old. Okay, the notion of grammar. Language is modeled by grammar. The grammar that you have studied in the school corresponds to language modeling. We want to create a model of what is language. And what is the central question there? Is this sentence a grammatical sentence or not? No, this is the central question you have asked. Okay, the sky blue is not a grammatical phrase. The blue sky is grammatical. That's what you have learned in the school, in the grammar. So we have built a model of what is in the language and what is outside language. Okay, so, so the notion of grammar is at least 2000 years old. Therefore, language model is not a new entity. Though you might think it is a new entity, it's not. Now we come to the practicalities. Depending on which you will decide whether to do this course or not. 
Okay, so let's be very practical. I think most of you would like to do because NLP is very hot and large language models are very hot and so on. But in the course, you will have to have the foundations extremely well. Okay. Okay, topics to be covered. We'll spend time on single neuron, the perceptron, and the, the sigmoid function, the nonlinearity, the application of single neuron to uh, text classification, probabilistic te text classification. We'll draw that parallel, but it's not really a, a huge application. Then multilayer fit forward network and back propagation, softmax function. These will occupy us for quite a few classes. Okay, very important. So they, they have to be attended to. An application of multilayer fit forward neural network to different NLP tasks. So wherever you have multi class classification problem in NLP, for example, emotion detection. A piece of text has uh, surprise, joy, anticipation, all these emotions. Okay, so this is a multi class classification problem. And we have to use maybe softmax or a combination of softmax layers, machines. Then recurrent neural network is sequence to sequence transformation. Many uh, problems in NLP are sequence to sequence trans transformation. The most important example is machine translation. A sentence in one language becomes a sentence in another language. This sequence to sequence. But what is not so obvious is that summarization is also a sequence to sequence transformation. Large document becoming smaller. Question answering is sequence to sequence transformation. Input is a sequence, which is a question. Output is an answer. So this is also a transformation. Okay. So this is a, a recurrent neural network and its application to sequence to sequence transformation. Recursive neural networks. So they are application to, uh, they are applied to wherever a recursive structure needs to be built. For example, a parse tree. Okay. So here, the, uh, the, the deep learning system feeds on its own output. Okay, that's a slightly colorful phrase, but we mention it this way. A recurrent neural network is processing the input, but uh, it is also taking as next input its own output. That's why it is called recursive neural network. Then we have convolutional neural networks, which have been very successful in image captioning, image classification, image understanding. And uh, uh, that uh, convolutional neural networks have been uh, mainly used for multimodal natural language processing, where we have text and image together. Then transformers, application to machine translation, question answering, and natural language generation. And finally, large language models and their application. But though LLM is the last mentioned topic, LLM will permeate the course, okay? In every lecture or every two second or third lecture, we'll have to make reference to LLM and look at what chat GPT is doing, GPT-3 is doing, GPT-4 is doing, okay? That we'll have to do all the time. But the theory of large language models, we have to understand that very carefully. So this is the uh, topics to be covered. Okay, then uh, these were the topics in CS 626, NLP and ambiguity, part of speech tagging, parsing, maths for NLP, linguistics for NLP, machine translation and machine translation evaluation, medical NLP, hypothesis testing. So these were the broad topics which are covered last semester. Do take a look at them, okay? Then uh, course basic info, it is in slot nine, Monday 3.30 and Thursday 3.30. Venue, uh, venue, we, the venue will be finalized on Saturday. Okay, I believe this class has a uh, large number of registrants, about 160 people are registered, I see. So this classroom will not fit. Most probably in, it will be one of the lecture hall complex rooms. TA team, Shravanti, you have seen her already. Abhishek, RK, Tejpal, you are here. Maybe you can just rise and show yourself. Okay, Tejpal. Tejpal is finishing his master's. Ravanti is a PhD student. Abhishek is also a master MS student, passing out in June. 
Tathagata is uh, MTech uh, second year student. Tathagata is not here. Samir is um, MS2 student. Pavan is here. Pavan will be graduating this June after finishing his dual degree. And Sanyam is an undergraduate uh, student. Uh, Sanyam is here. Okay. <coughs> okay. Right. So this is the TA team and they're extremely useful to uh, know. You should connect with them. You should keep them happy. And so, okay. yeah. and the, for for clearing your doubts, and there will be groups of students or group uh, different groups assigned to a specific TAs. So do always meet them for any any problem. Okay. Then uh, the course website is this. Can somebody see if this course website is working? Is it working? It's working. Okay. So this is uh, www.cfield. Cfield is our lab. Computation for Indian Language Technology, cfield.iitb.ac.in tilde CS772 underscore 2024. Hmm? Channels of communication, MS Teams, Moodle, and course website. Do keep visiting the course website for any kind of announcement. They will also appear in MS Teams and Moodle. But it will be mainly, team, mainly Teams based, right? Most communications happen through Teams. So that's why. This is very important. Team's name is CS772-2024, not 2023, right? 2024, sorry, there is a mistake here. And the joining code is very important, OP38BR, OP38BR. Why? Oh, YBR, OP38YBR. Okay, so this is very important. So see that you are part of the team's, team's team. Also visit the model regular uh, frequently. Now here I have to take a pause and uh, tell you something. So these teams being member of the teams is very important because sometimes there will be online lectures. Okay, if I miss a lecture, if I want to take an extra lecture, it will be online. All extra lectures will be online. Okay, all lectures which are not scheduled will be online. So that's why being part of these teams, MS Teams group is important. And uh, we have an actual case coming up very soon. On Monday, we'll have the second lecture. Thursday, I'm out of station. So Monday night, we'll have the Thursday's lecture done. Okay, can you announce that, uh, Shravati? Yeah. The lecture of next Thursday will be on Monday night because I am out of station. Another uh, uh, such case will arise on on the week of 29th, 28th January. Okay, uh, 29th January, I guess. 29th is a Monday, I believe. So that week I'm not present. So those lectures I'll take before, again, online. Okay, do please remember that. And attend all the lectures positively. Please attend all the lectures. Because maybe some of you have heard this before and you might be tired of hearing this. Many things in the in the material that is covered are not in the papers, not in the books. Okay, they are directly from our experience or directly from my own understanding. Let's say. Okay, and also Moodle will be used quite frequently. Evaluation, hmm? the all important evaluation scheme, but it's tentative. Uh, we give in, in co all course offerings, I personally do this, I give 50% importance to reading and thinking or 50% of the evaluation tests your re reading and thinking and comprehending which means quizzes and NSEM. Sorry, quizzes, mid-SEM, NSEM. There will be quizzes, mid-SEM, NSEM. Okay, this I should uh, correct. And 50% is doing things and hands-on, assignments and course projects. Is it adding up to 100 or not? I'll have to see. Oh, oh, okay. Okay. So this, this, this particular slide will be cleaned up a bit. Okay. The sum and substance is that you will have quizzes, mid-sem, end-sem. You will have assignments and projects. Okay. And uh, weightages, 
do not do not be too concerned with weightages okay do not try to optimize okay <laughs> based on the weights do not try to it's a learning exercise so learn as much as you can now uh, my, again our, one of our practice has been the last thursday of the uh, month we devote to quiz okay so half of the last thursday therefore uh, the last thursday which uh, uh, which will not have a regular lecture because i am lecture i am because i am traveling i'll take take an online extra lecture but in that class you will have a 45 minutes quiz Twenty fifth. Okay. No, no, no. So then we'll have the quiz on first February. First February. I'm. I'm not. Yeah. There is mixem. So this this uh, this particular slide, it was copied from last year's offering. Last year we did not have a mixem. Huh? Number of as, number of assignments, number of assignments will be at most three. Yeah, but there will be a course project. Okay, and assignments and projects will have to have to be done in groups of three. Please get your partners. Okay, teams of three, size three. Okay, so this is the evaluation scheme, but tentative. Okay, tentative. Quizzes and NSEMs have a specific pattern. There will be eight questions or multiple choice question, multiple choice type. In mid-SEM and NSEM, you will have eight multiple choice type questions and two subjective questions. And those for the answer to those two subjective questions have to be written on a single page. Okay. Written on a single page. One side for one question, the other side for the other question. You will not be given any extra sheet of papers. So, eight MCQs, two subjective questions for mid-SEM and NSEM. <coughs> quizzes may have, you know, quizzes will always have only MCQs, no subjective question. Any question on the quizzes evaluation scheme? Yeah, please. Negative marking will be there. Okay. Hmm. Audit, uh, audit. Your if you take this as an audit course, your assignments will not be evaluated. Okay, you can only write the quiz and answer it. Okay, for, okay. Audit requirement. I think some people will ask me this. Question. Audit requirement is only write the exams, quizzes, mid-sem, answer. That's all. Okay, assignments and <coughs> projects will have continuous evaluation. We would like to meet the teams every two weeks to see what is the progress. And uh, this continuous evaluation means in every meeting, you will get some marks. Okay, you need not finish the assignment, but you will be uh, given, you will be awarded marks based on the progress that you have made. And uh, credit for thorough literature survey for the project work. The project work must show that you have read all the relevant papers and your uh, transparency should have those material. Okay, books. So this has uh, remained a, a kind of uh, classic book for deep learning. Though some of the material is again uh, outdated, I should say, the field moves so fast. Ian Goodfellow, Yoshua Benjo and Aaron Kurville, deep learning, MIT Press. Dan Jurafsky and James Martin, speech and language processing. This is to understand what is NLP and what are NLP tasks? Okay. By the way, I forgot to mention this. Uh, a book written by me and Aditya Joshi that has come out recently. Okay. So that's a good textbook to have. Na it's called Natural Language Processing, written by me and Aditya Joshi. Just, just this this year it has come out. Okay. I should have mentioned this here. Then for, for machine learning based NLP, this is a very good book, Christopher Manning and Hendrik uh, Schutz. And for machine translation, the, which is, which is uh, covering everything up to deep learning, 
not in excluding deep learning that is uh, something you can refer to because machine translation is really one of the success stories of deep learning based NLP okay. and I should add to it uh, our recent book. Journals and conferences are very important okay all the recent material are in mainly in conferences. Computational linguistics is an uh, is an A star category journal. So, should uh, refer to computational linguistics. Then natural language engineering is more practice oriented. Uh, computational linguistics covers lot of theoretical element also. Then journal of machine learning research JMLR neural computation IEEE transactions on neural networks all of them have uh, these days at least some 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 papers on natural language processing. Conferences are more important than journals in our field. Mm -hmm. Okay, so ACL for example is our flagship conference, EMNLP, NSCL, ESCL, ASCL, New Reefs, ICML, all these are, uh, are our flagship conferences. The latest material is covered in those journals and conferences. Okay, and then useful NLP, MLDL libraries, NLTK for natural language processing. We have a lot of talking going on in the class, a lot of talking, please be silent. Scikit learn is good for ML libraries, PyTorch TensorFlow for deep learning systems, hugging face in red, I, I've shown it shown this in, in red, lots of very important resources tools are to be obtained from hugging face, maybe many of you are already using it, but uh, this is an important platform for us, spacey mainly for lots of uh, NLP tools again, though you are using deep learning you may have to use uh, other NLP tools also for your assignments and projects. Then Stanford Core NLP gives lots of uh, libraries and tools again for NLP. Indian language processing tools and resources you will find them in our labs homepage CPIT. Okay, now what can deep learning for NLP do for us? Let me just uh, you know give a uh, give a uh, short uh, glimpse of the problem. Um, all uh, machine learning based NLP is based on one equation, only one equation. Okay, all equation, all other equations are variations of this one equation. This is E star equal to arg max over E probability of E given F where f is the input, e is the output. So, f can be a Hindi sentence, e can be an English sentence. f can be a document, e can be a summary. f can be a question, e can be a, an answer. f can be two sentences, e can be a one zero decision saying whether these two sentences are paraphrase of each other or not. Okay, so this is the overarching formula for all machine learning based NLP whether it is DL or statistical in machine learning does not matter. Now, what deep learning does is that it implements this equation that is all ok in multiple layers it implements this probability probabilistic modeling. So, we can do dialogue act classification using deep learning where the where f is the dialogue sequence and u is dialogue turn levels. Dialogue intent f is the dialogue sequence and e is the dialogue turn with intent like question, elaboration, affirmation, uh, command request etc. Let me give you an example. Uh, there is a dialogue between a and b. a asks, so do you go to college right now? b says uh, something are you okay. Then B says yeah, then again B says it is my last year and there is a short laughter also. Then A says you are so you are a senior now, so this is an example of disfluency, wanted to say you are something and then changes track and says so you are a senior now. B says yeah, then again B says I am working on my projects trying to graduate. 
So you see B's B's uh, participation in this conversation is quite good. B always gives more information than just yes, no, mm. right? So A says, oh, good for you. Then B says, yeah. A says, that's great. A says, mm. is, is NC university, is that a state, is it a state university? So that is a disfluent sentence. Then B says, NC state. North Carolina state. A says, what did you say? B says, NC state. So these utterances are called dialogue terms. This whole sequence is called a dialogue and every element is called a dialogue term. Okay. And it is important, very important for any conversational agent to uh, understand the term and give it levels. These levels are called dialogue act. So first question from A is a yes, no question. So do you go to college right now? The answer is yes or no. And then there is a label called abandoned because this text was not completed. Then the label is yes answer. Then it's a statement. It is my last year. Then a declarative question. Then a yes answer. Then a statement. Then appreciation. Then back channel. Back channel is confirmation. Appreciation, yes, no question, statement, signal, non-understanding. What did you say? Statement, yes. So you can see that every uh, turn of the dialogue needs to be passing through a classifier, okay, multi-class classifier. What is the level of that statement, okay? So this <coughs> is done very well by conversational agents. You have as a proof chat GPT in front of you. It understands the turns and the intents extremely well. Understands, I'm saying understands. Huh? Now, this, uh, this kind of labeling and classification has uh, found uh, application in a very interesting problem, the mental health monitoring problem. So if you have many abandons, abandonments, the person cannot complete the sentence most of the time. <laughs> then it indicates some kind of disorder, either neurophysical or maybe psychological. So if, what if there are many abandons, raise a flag, it's a linguistic limitation or mental health problem. Mental health doctors would like help of chatbots that can give preliminary help to mental health patients by engaging in a dialogue. So this is some research we are doing, Palash and Raja Kumar are the students from our lab. And this is, this is emerging as a very important problem application of NLP, okay? Or they can do a preliminary screening based on disfluencies, abandoned statements, and so on, after which the qualified psych psychologist or psychiatrist or neurologist can look at the patient, okay? This is definitely happening. Lots of uh, routine task is being delegated by doctors to chat chatbots. Of course, with proper screening, rider, disclaimer and so on. So uh, we had a paper on dialogue, uh, dialogue act classification in 2020 in ACL. So maybe I'll present this paper in the next class or some subsequent class. But all this has become possible now. Okay, so now uh, we'd like to finish, it's five o'clock. So the next class will be in another venue. There will be online lectures whenever I miss a class or if I want to take an extra class, please become a member of the teams okay, and form groups. Thank you.